All right, so today we're going to talk about addition of whole numbers. So uh, whole numbers we, we've already learned are just our positive whole numbers um, as well as zero. So specifically here, we are not considering negative numbers at all. All right, so in the grade one common core standards, we find the following, that students should be able to add within 100, including adding a two-digit two number and a one-digit number and then adding two-digit numbers and multiples of 10. We'll talk about um, different strategies for adding with 10, uh, using concrete models or drawings, uh, strategies pay, blay, pay, okay, based on place value, properties of operations, and or the relationship between addition and subtraction. Relate the strategy to a written method and then explain the reasoning used. And then understand that adding two-digit numbers one adds tens and tens, ones and ones, and then sometimes it's necessary to compose a 10 out of two different numbers that you have. All right, so there are typically or generally two different models for teaching addition. There is a set model. That's where you're working with like little objects, you know, like those little blocks that you click together or um, the base 10 blocks. And then we also have a number line or a measurement model. And a lot of times I actually um, learned that there's a lot of problems that are not suitable for a set model. So um, anything where you have a certain amount and then you add um, another quantity of that amount. So for example, like they have one example where um, a person had drank four glasses of orange juice in a day um, and then they drank three more glasses. Um, you know, and they wanted you to figure out how many glasses of orange juice there were all together. There's only one cup, you know what I mean? So it's not like you would have seven cups. Like the person is only using the same cup every time. So that in that case, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't make sense to use a set model. And instead you would use something like a number line model. All right, so the example I came up with for the set model was suppose that Jane has four blocks in one pile and three blocks in another pile. If she combines the two groups, how many objects are in the combined group? So that's an example where you might use these little blocks, these little blocks that click together. Um, maybe she has two little groups of these blocks. I just chose two different colors to kind of represent that they are in separate groups. Um, and then this is one way that you could represent what would be the uh, equation that you're representing here as we would read it. Yeah, four plus three equals seven. Another way you might represent this is on like a, a 10 frame. Right, so I, I'm envisioning like two different colored uh, little, you know, bingo circle things. And uh, you could represent, use the set model to represent four plus three that way as well a great example of where something like the set model doesn't work. Um, Kenzo has four feet of red ribbon and three feet of white ribbon. How many feet of ribbon does he have altogether? So this is where you might want to introduce a number line. Um, your book goes into detail about what is considered a number line and what is not considered a number line. Um, they say that you should always have at least zero to one represented on that line. So that way the student has some frame of reference for how far that distance should be. All right, so in this number line, I, I went ahead and put four feet of red ribbon. So you can see that's perfectly represented there. We have a piece of ribbon um, and now we can actually get a, a numerical quantity um, related to that ribbon by placing it on this number line. They told us that we have three feet of white ribbon. All right, so what we're going to do to represent um, addition here is we're just going to lay those pieces of ribbon side by side. Right in there, we have also represented, so this is another way you could represent four plus three equals seven. All right, so the set model and the number line model are um, generally the two most popular models of addition. where you are working with something tangible. All right, so 
like I said, they also have another example where you have like one person with one glass of, of uh, orange juice and they're drinking multiple glasses in the day. Um, and so that one you could represent on the number line model as well. Okay. Now, they just talked briefly about ordering whole numbers um, and teaching kids about how to figure out which value is larger. Um, this is in the kindergarten core, common core standards. Uh, students should be able to figure out whether the number of objects in one group is greater than, less than, or equal to the number of objects in another group. Um, so, and they should be able to compare two numbers between one and 10 when they're presented just as written numerals and, and not with like a set model. So they should be able to look at the numbers three and seven and know which one is larger. All right, so we know our symbols, but I, I know that some people struggle with remembering which way is which. So I figured I would show you greater than, it's like an arrow pointing to the right. All right so if you think about like, if you drew a line there and made it into an arrow. So the greater than is like an arrow pointing to the right. Less than is like an arrow pointing to the left. Um, but how did you, how did, every, I bet everyone learned it the same way. How did, Louisiana, they call it a sand mouth. Yes, mouth. yeah, the alligator mouth. And so they actually showed a picture where a, a teacher had drawn the greater than or less than symbol. And then they added the little teeth on like this. Um, so you'll probably encounter, uh, now some books, of course, I mean, everyone has a different opinion. Some books say, oh, this is a terrible way to teach greater than or less than. But I mean, I was in elementary school many, many years ago and they taught it this way and they're still teaching it this way. So it can't be that bad. Yeah. Yeah. If it, if it works, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's what they say. So greater than, we've got our little alligator. Um, you know, if you drew an arrow through here, if you pointed to the right. This is the formal definition of greater than. Uh, no one asked, but this is the formal definition of greater than. It says if A and B are numbers that are not negative, then we say that A is greater than B, and we write A, and then the little greater than symbol, and then B. So you can see that the alligator mouth is open towards the A. So the alligator always wants to eat the larger number um, if A represents a larger quantity than B. All right, so we, we know what greater than and less than mean. Um, I would never ask you to regurgitate a definition like this, so don't worry about, um, you know, memorizing definitions. What's important to me is that you're able to implement the things that we're going to learn today. But, um, I just thought that was interesting. I'd never thought about what the definition of greater than meant or greater than was. All right, and so this is the same alligator, and all I did was I just went into the little, you know, picture tools on a PowerPoint, and I just flipped him the other way. So, um, you know, if you're creating something in the future like this, then utilize those uh, those types of, of picture tools to help you not have to recreate brand new graphics. All right, so that's the uh, formal definition for less than. If A represents a smaller quantity than B, then we say that A is less than B, and we write A with the less than symbol and then B. So you can see the alligator mouth is open towards the B because A represents a smaller quantity. All right, so here's where we get into the fun stuff. This is where we are going to, I'm going to teach you today how to teach someone else how to add. All right, so we're going to learn three basic um, addition facts, so counting on doubles and then making 10. All right, these are, these are pretty straightforward. The next set of, uh, of strategies that I'm going to show you are a little bit more complicated, maybe something you haven't thought about or used before. Um, but counting on is where you start with a predetermined value and then you count on from it. All right, so instead of taking a big pile of blocks and starting with one, two, three, you're going to say, okay, I already know that I have four red blocks. So I'm going to count on from four. All right, so you start with a predetermined value and then count on from it. Now, we do this all the time in our head, right? But this is something that um, 
kids would spend a lot of time starting from one. You know, imagine if you had, I don't know, 30 blocks laying on the on the table and you told them, okay, I, this is 20 blocks right here. You know, if they start from one, two, three, that's going to take them forever. But if they start with 20 and then count on, then they're getting to the same end result and it's taking them much less time. All right, so starting with a predetermined value and counting on from it. So, for example, uh, with the problem 5 plus 3, one way I thought of representing that is maybe you tell them, okay, here's five green gummy bears. And I'm going to give you three more gummy bears. How many do you have in total? All right, so instead of having them start with one, two, three, you would say, okay, start with the five gummy bears that you already had, then count on from five. So six, seven, eight. All right, so this would be using which model, the set model or the measurement model? Yeah, set model. They also do a lot of um, measurement model stuff with counting on as well. And what they'll do is, I'm not, I'm not sure like what group of students this would be best for, but they kind of layer the number lines. So for example, they might start with a number line that looks like, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. And they'll have tiny little number lines that go underneath it and say, this is two. And then this is three. So they'll, they'll layer those and then combine them into an, an addition problem. So you'll see some of this um, possibly on the homework, or if you look in the textbook, you'll see layers of number lines. And that's just using a counting on method with the measurement model. All right, so doubles. Um, doubles are something that kids learn uh, pretty early. So they'll learn, you know, what's double three or double four. Um, and so taking two numbers that are the same and then adding them together. And the general idea here is that once students master doubles, then you can say like, you know, three plus five, that's double three plus two. All right, so once they've mastered doubles, then they can take other problems like five plus three and say, okay, well, that's really the same thing as three plus three plus two. So that would be double three plus two. All right, so that's using the associative property. Um, I noticed that um, whenever, what they want you to know, they want you to know what property you're using. They want you to know, is it the associative property? Is it the commutative property? Is it the identity property? But the students aren't going to be able to reference that, right? They're not going to say like, oh, I know that 5 plus 3 is 3 plus 3 plus 2 by the associative property. Um, they're just going to know that, they're, they're going to just assume that that works, right, unless you tell them otherwise. So, but they want you to know what properties um, are in play there whenever a student does something like that and breaks that problem down into different pieces. All right, so here's an example I came up with with doubles. All right, so six plus seven, you could break that down into six plus, six plus one. Six plus one gives you that seven that was in the original problem. And then just reordering that, that's the associative property. Regrouping, I should say. So regrouping that gives you six plus six plus one, so double six plus one, which is 13. All right, so doubles, it says doubles receive special attention, especially in earlier grades. All right, and then last one is making 10. This is pretty, uh, you know, intuitive of what making 10 is. You turn one of the add-ins into a 10. So this is where I wanted to make sure that you knew what an add-in was. So any, let's say that we have the problem 7 plus 4. 7 and 4 are called the add-ins. A-D-D-E-N-D-S, add-ins. So if you have something like 7 plus 4, 7 and 4 are referred to as the add-ins. 
All right, so making 10 is where you turn one of the add-ins into a 10. So you have to borrow from the other add-in and, and change that into a 10. All right, so here is my example for making 10. If you have 8 plus 4, I did this with a 10 frame. Um, go ahead and put 8 little blue dots in my 10 frame. And then I put my 4, my second add-in down there at the bottom. I'm going to borrow two from my second add-in to fill in my 10 frame. If y'all knew how long that took me to figure out how to do that, you would be much more impressed right now. I was so proud of myself when I figured that out. Um, so you, you borrow a couple from the second add-in to make 10. And now we just have 10 plus 2 it makes it into a much easier problem. And then you can really expand on this to, you know, larger values like 18 plus 14. You know, you could think of it the same way as making 10. You could say 18 plus 14. I know I'm going to take the 10 from the 18, 10 from the 14. That's going to leave me with 8 plus 4, and then you recreate this process. Yeah. Really? Okay, yeah. Like five from the eight. Yes. Yeah, and, and like that's really what this whole section is all about. It's like formalizing those thought process that thought processes that we that many of us do and in our everyday lives and, and just taking them and putting them into words to teach kids. And I, I really feel like that's the common core. Let me pause it for a second. All right, so making 10, that's another basic addition fact. So this is something that if you plan on teaching lower grades, this may be stuff that you, um, that you use in your day-to-day -day life. All right, so before we move on to my strategies for um, addition, I'm going to have to go over our three properties. I know you've seen these before. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on them. Um, I may put find like a little video on YouTube and link it in our D2L that, that covers these more in depth. Um, but it says that in the grade one common core standards that students are expected to apply properties of operations like the commutative property and the associative property. They may not necessarily know the names of them but they are expected to be able to apply those properties. All right, so we have three properties of addition, the commutative property, the associative property, and the identity property. All right, so commutative, um, the way I always thought of this is commutative is where you just are switching the order, switching the order, and the associative is where you are regrouping. Commutative property, that's our property that tells us that 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. All right, so you can switch the order when you're adding, um, and it does not affect the, the outcome. Um, Associative property is what we just saw with like 6 plus 7. That's the same thing as 6 plus 6 plus 1. And then you can regroup and say 6 plus 6 plus 1. All right, so regrouping is the associative property. And then identity property. Identity means um, like the same. So in math, when you see the word identity, typically it refers to one, but I'm going to call it the same. So it's what number can you perform uh, the addition operation with and it doesn't change the value. So that would be zero. Right? So three plus zero is, is three. Um, in multiplication, the identity is one. Three times one is three. All right, so it's whatever you, whatever you can perform the operation with and it's not going to change the value. All right, so commutative property of addition. This is the formal definition uh, or the formal uh, property. It says if A and B are whole numbers, then A plus B 
is equal to b plus a. All right, so like we said, this is your property that says 3 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 3. All right, so you can switch the order of your add-ins without changing the outcome. So what you'll be asked to do on the homework is you'll be asked to look at a problem and determine what property is being used. So if we have time at the end of class, I'll pull up some of those from the homework and uh, show you some examples. All right, so if A and B are whole numbers, then A plus B is equal to B plus A. All right, so this was my example before I wrote over it. Let me erase that. Okay, so this was my example for uh, the commutative property is from my gummy bear example from earlier. If I have five gummy bears plus three gummy bears, that is the same as three gummy bears plus five gummy bears. All right, so the order does not matter. All right, so the associative property, this is the formal associative property. It says that if A, B, and C have to have three values for associative property, if A, B, and C are whole numbers, then, then we have A plus B in parentheses and then plus C on the outside. You can regroup that and put um, B and C together and have A on the outside. All right, so what this is really saying is that you can add in any order. So um, if you have a list of numbers written in, you know, in a vertical line. You can start from the top and add down, or you can start from the bottom and add up. It does not matter the ways in which you group these numbers. You're going to get the same outcome. All right, so I used a base 10 uh, example for this one. All right, so if I had 18 plus 14, that's on one side of my table, plus 15, on the other side of my table. The associative property says I can take those 14 blocks and I can move it over to the other side of the table, regroup it so that I have 14 over there with the 15, and it's not gonna change the outcome. It's equal to 47 both ways. All right, so um, I think this is a good visual to show students that nothing is changing. All right, so I don't know why it won't let me go back. But nothing is changing. When I pick up those 14 blocks and move them to the other side of the table, it's not changing how many blocks are on the table. Um, so that's a good visual to show that with addition, nothing is changing um, when, you, when you regroup. Okay. Identity property, this is the easiest one, so I didn't even put an example on here of this one. It just says there's a unique whole number zero, which is called the additive identity. Um, and like we said, in multiplication, one is called the multiplicative identity because anything multiplied by one just gives you that original number. All right, so the identity property of addition says if A is a whole number, then A plus zero is equal to a, which is equal to zero plus a. So if you add zero at the end, if you add zero at the beginning, it doesn't matter. Um, it's not going to affect the value of a. All right, so zero is called the additive identity. All right, so here's where we get into our, um, the sort of the meat of this section, the addition algorithms. Um, this is in the grades three and four common core standards that want students to be able to fluently add and subtract within a thousand using different strategies and algorithms placed on, based on place value, properties of operations, and or the relationship between addition and subtraction. 
fluently add and subtract multi-digit whole numbers using the standard algorithm. So standard algorithm, that's what, you know, we all learn where you, you know, borrow from the neighbor, that kind of thing. All right, so that, the standard algorithm, anytime you hear that, that's where, think of it as like, you know, 17 minus 9, where you had to go, okay, 7 minus 9, I can't do that, so I'm going to go over here on borrow 1 from my neighbor, make that 17, 17 minus 9 is 6. <laughs> So you can see this standard algorithm has some flaws, right? Mm -hmm. It's not very intuitive. Um, so we got lots of different algorithms today. I will, as we go through, I'll tell you the ones that um, are going to be on the homework. I did go through and check and see which ones were, were on the homework. And there's a lot more that I'm not covering that's in your book, but I, I went ahead and took off anything that I knew for sure was not going to be in the homework. Yeah, there's a lot of them. All right, so this is our base 10 blocks, and uh, I found this little clip art of some virtual base 10 blocks, uh, which is useful, I'm sure, for you know the folks that had to go online during the pandemic. Um, something like this is really useful for you know still being able to provide students with a visual, even on uh, a computer screen. All right, so here's our problem, 43 plus 27. All right, so we're going to go through using our base 10 blocks, how we would add 43 and 27, and then how we would do that using the concrete model, which is that, that standard algorithm. All right, so if you want to, if you have enough of your little uh, algebra tiles, you can use those to follow along if you want to. Or you can draw them on your table, whatever you want to do. All right, so I'm going to start by putting my two numbers um, in my middle square there, my, the middle part of my table. Um, so I've got 43. I've got three of the, or excuse me, I have four of the um, tens, my ten blocks. And then I got three of my one blocks. And then... For 27, I've got two of my little 10 blocks, and then seven of my one blocks. I remember this like being so fun when I was in school. Do y'all remember these? My my husband says that he did not remember using these in school. I was like, you probably just weren't paying attention. But I feel like everyone saw some type of base 10 block. So, yeah, the ones that um, you have are kind of like a, uh, you know, more economical base 10 block. Um, they, you know, you can't really see the little lines to where it shows that it's 10. Um, but this was, we our department bought this for us last semester. And I think this was the only way we could get like a whole classroom set was to buy the algebra tiles instead of the base 10 blocks. All right, so if you were adding this with your students, then you would probably uh, do some switching around here. So what I did was um, I said, okay, I would move these ones down here to the bottom, kind of group them together. They sort of seem to be going in a random order. All right, so once you have the one separated, you're just kind of grouping like with like. Um, then you can count up how many tens do I have, how many ones do I have. All right, so counting up my tens, I have six of my ten blocks, and I have how many ones? Ten. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and switch out those uh, ones for a 10 block. All right, and then I'm going to move it up and join it with its uh, with its similar blocks. Now you can quickly see that that's 70. All right, so... The, the, those base 10s are the ones that connect together, right? 
that there's some that connect together and then there's some that are you know they're just kind of stuck together oh. yeah but yeah we also have we have a teacher set we don't have enough for everybody in our department but it's just one little set of the blocks that click together too those, but yeah those are my favorite i think they just make a very satisfying sound when you click them together all right so let's go through the standard algorithm how we would have uh taught this or how we may have been taught when we were in school all right what would you start with here three and seven and you would say three plus seven is ten so i'm not going to write ten down here right what am i going to do good i'm going to put the zero down there and i'm going to carry the one over here all right then what am i going to do Good. Four plus two is six. Yep. So seven. So seventy. All right. So standard algorithm, totally still used. Um, they they still expect students to be able to add in this way, um, but they also want students to be able to visualize what's happening, which is with our base ten blocks, we can visualize that. Um, you know, we're taking our ones place, the three and the seven, we're grouping those into 110, and then we're moving them up um, and joining them with the uh, six other 10 blocks. Yeah, we're, I was teaching second grade um, Monday at Fort Stewart at Diamond Elementary and um, you know, federal sub two. Mm -hmm. So they, um, we were doing the ones and tens places and they call them doing quick picks. Mm -hmm. But basically it's the same where they were taking the 10 blocks. Okay, so how many 10 blocks do you have? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two, and then I have nine ones. Mm -hmm. So it's like two tens, nine ones, what do I have? Right. Like 29. Yeah. It's really interesting to, like, it's, you know, adding is something you probably haven't thought about in a long time. You know, you just do it. So it's interesting to think about, like, how would I explain this to someone who's literally never added before? You know, it, it's kind of over, like I had like a mini like mental breakdown last week about it. That's why I never got the video up because I was just so stressed about, you know, this is so important. You know, it's not like, um, you know, a random, you know, not not to be shady, but like a random, you know, elective class that you're just taking you know this is like this is so important like what you're doing is 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 one of the most important jobs that a person can have like teaching someone else how to do something that they're going to use for the rest of their life it, yeah, it's kind of stressful I haven't, yeah. taught, I haven't taught this like my son my stepson he's in he's in high school and he's like dad you know how to do two-step equations? I was like, yes, sir, I do. Come on, sit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff is like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, break it down break this it far. Down for yeah. Now, multiplication I do, like, with the fifth graders, because a lot of them still don't know their multiplication. Class. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, if you have five times three, you know that's going to be 15. They don't. Right. So what I do is, is I said, okay, well, you could do five tick marks in three mm -hmm. sets and mm -hmm. then count it because mm -hmm. all multiplication is is repetitive addition. Mm -hmm. And yep. so they've done that and they were able to get the answer. Yeah. They're like, I never knew that. I was like, well, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it's crazy some of the things that you learn that people don't know. I even taught the teacher that. I was like, <laughs> I wouldn't even have thought of that, Mr. Richardson. I was like, well, I guess something I know came up with. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you have to take it, especially the kids that are in, you know, elementary school now. You have to take into consideration like what all happened with COVID and, and what they may have missed, and like the gaps that they may have in their knowledge of, of how to add. I mean, imagine you're at home with your kid during the pandemic trying to teach them a partial sums algorithm. Like, that makes no sense to someone who's, like, already, you know, they're maybe working from home. Like, they're stressed out. They have other things going on. They don't want to learn, like, what is the opposite change algorithm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of them have these um, these math programs, like on the Chromebooks. Like, yeah. Because like what we did, at Stu what they do with Stewart is, is they have um, they have a whiteboard. Everything's up on the whiteboard for the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the whole day is mapped out. Your whole lesson plan is on the whiteboard, and it it, it shocked me because I've I've never experienced this. Yeah. It's like state of the art 21st century. The classrooms aren't divided. It's like an open classroom. There's like two classrooms that are open. Oh wow. So this teacher and this teacher they work together, and sometimes the students will go back and forth. Okay. And so we have stations. And so when she's doing stations, we do stations. Mm -hmm. And what it is is you, you put a timer on for like 15 minutes, and you have groups one through four, mm -hmm. and then each group has their own. Uh, they have like three rounds, and each group has their own station. So you'll have like technology, which is where you're on your Chromebook doing some kind of math program or reading program, right. whichever time so, it is. Yeah. And then you'll have like phonics, where they'll be doing like phonics stuff, or they'll have like um, like math, where you're taking shapes and putting them on like the the cards mm -hmm. with, the, with the little blocks, like with the trapezoids. And yeah, the yeah. And you're creating shapes using that. So right. Identification. And then they would have flashcards. So they have like addition flashcards or subtraction flashcards that are that they're <laughs> station. Yeah. And so every 15 minutes, when the timer goes, the group switches and they look on the board and see what that group's supposed oh, to Oh, wow. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. That, I, that seems. Me. It was the first time I've ever seen this. So yeah, that's like, totally different than probably what a lot of us experienced where we were just sitting in a desk watching the teacher talk for hours. Yeah. That's how it is at, at um, Lowland. You literally write your lesson plans out by hand, mm -hmm. you get all your, all your paperwork and handouts, and you just go from, like in the morning, you go from like science, social studies, then you have like exploratory, which is their health science or PE or whatever. Yeah art, music, and then they go into uh, ELA. There's a lot of time for ELA. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, you go into recess or you go to lunch, and then you'll come back, and then you'll have like a whole big section for math. So these kids literally stay in their desk most of the day, yeah. minus lunch and recess and bathroom breaks. Yeah. And all they do is just hand papers, papers, papers. Well, over there, it's totally different. It's like way different. Yeah, and I think that that would that's probably the goal of most teachers, right? Is to teach in that way, where you're like up and they're doing stuff and they're yeah. they're you know, I, I'm sure there's tons of studies out there that have shown that like kids' attention, like their attention span is like 30 seconds. It's like something insane. Um, you know, so sitting in a desk and just you know, listen to someone talk for an hour, it's really not reasonable to ask a, like a seven-year-old to do that. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm all fidgety even, yeah. So yeah. Like, so what I, a lot of times what I do is, is after we finish a subject, like I'll get them to stand up and go like, yeah. shake it out, just shake it out. Yeah. Because <laughs> I want them to, you know, get the blood flowing and kind of just relax for a minute yeah not have that like expectation you know for just a few minutes that like yeah. i'm not expecting you to be fully attentive and yeah. you know quiet and still and whatever so our let's see Pardon. these are five algorithms here we have for addition i can tell you for sure that the scratch algorithm is not on the homework um I don't, I don't think so, but I, I did like it. So I, whenever I saw that it wasn't on the homework, I, I thought, well, I'll go ahead and still show you because I thought it was useful. Um, but we will exclude it from the test since it was not on the homework. Um, so we've got partial sums algorithm, lattice algorithm, column addition, opposite change, and then scratch. Um, I would say... A lot of these, whenever I first started looking at them, I thought this is like the longest possible way to do this problem. Um, but the way that was best for me to, to figure out how to do it was 
to watch a video of someone else doing it. So if you are on the homework and you're stuck on any of these, um, then go watch a video and you know just just Google exactly what it says: partial sums algorithm example or like elementary math. And and uh, there's a ton of like really short like you know a minute long video um, about how to do these, and it was super helpful as opposed to just reading what it says. All right, so partial sums, lattice, column addition, opposite chain scratch. All right, so here is the partial sums algorithm. Again, this is probably something that you're doing already in your head. It's just formalizing what you're doing. All right, so take a problem like 568 plus 757. All right, so you would start and say, okay, I'm going to take 500 and 700. I'm going to add those up. Why 500 and 700? Yes. Good. Once you've added the 500 and the 700, you have to take care of what you've left out. So we have the 68 and the 57. So they're breaking that down and they're saying, okay, 68, I'm going to take 60. 57, I'm going to take 50. I'm going to add those up. So you're really just kind of adding by place value here. Hundreds and tens, yeah. Yep. And to me, whenever I first looked at this, I, I felt really overwhelmed. Like, this seems like a lot of work compared to what we're used to seeing of like, you know, where we would say 8 plus 7 is 5, carry the 1. So this it does seem like a lot of extra work, but the emphasis here is that, you know, 500 plus 700, that's something you can do in your head. You don't necessarily need to be writing that down. Um, all right, so... So is it like only one answer? Yes, the answer is just, you know, whatever... 568 plus 757 is. Oh, oh, like you're saying, is this the answer? Oh, I got you. Yes, there is different ways that you can do it, which we're going to look at, but this, this is the only way you can do partial sums. Yeah, so let's do one more. I'm going to pause the video. We'll do it on the board. Next. We have the lattice algorithm. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I meant to watch a video about this on the way here today, but I forgot. But I actually don't know how this one works, so let me scratch this one out. We're not going to have this. I'm going to have to go in and remove it from the homework. Yeah, when I was looking at it, I thought, okay, I can just figure this out by looking at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so one five one three one one. Yeah, that's Where does the nine come from? I think you're telling me. I think you need to go. Yeah. So. Oh, so the eight and one. Oh, so nine. Nine and then ten. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I, that that is totally my approach with all of my classes mm -hmm. is that, um, which I mean, you know, you have to consider the the students. Like, you know, when you teach college, you get students from literally hundreds of different schools. You know, people have learned hundreds of different ways to do stuff. And so, to me, I'm always fine with whatever way someone chooses to do something. But, yeah, I can also see the argument for, like, um, you know, wanting students to do everything the same. Uh, that way we're all on the same page. Georgia State standards changed this year for the schools, and so they're, they're teaching a specific state standard across the board, and um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous, some of the stuff that they've got on there, that, that these kids are going to um, So we'll plan to, I'm going to take this problem out of the homework, but we have figured it out. We figured out how to use it, um, and of course, this will not be on the test. Um, column addition. Now, this one um, reminds me a lot of our standard algorithm. Um, in the column addition algorithm, you just add the numbers in each column. You write the sum directly beneath the column, and then you regroup one column at a time. Right, and so it, it, it notes that base 10 blocks are frequently used um, with this particular algorithm. So we've got the problem 293 plus 146. They have broken it down into the 100s, the 10s, and the 1s. Um, if you um, visualize, like with base 10 blocks, you would have two of the base 10 blocks um, in the 100s column, you would have nine of the, or excuse me, you would have two of the 100 blocks in the in the hundreds column, you would have nine of the 10 blocks um, in the tens column, then three of the one blocks. All right, so you're just adding down the column, three plus six is nine, the middle column, that's where you get that extra number. 9 plus 4 is 13, and then 2 plus 1 is 3. And then you're going to regroup one, play, one uh, column at a time. We did not, there was no regrouping in the ones column um, because that number was not larger than 10. We do have to regroup in the tens column, so they're just taking that one, moving it over to the 100s column. Now, think about why that is. Um, that's because, think about if you had base 10 blocks and you had 13 base 10 blocks. You could take 10 of those base 10 blocks and make them into a 100 block. Does that make sense? So that's the like reasoning behind when you're explaining to students, like, why are we regrouping? It's because we have more than 10 of our 10s blocks, so we can regroup those and make them into a 100 block. All right, so not my favorite. I, I like the uh, partial sums better than this one myself. Opposite change. Now, this one is another one, sort of similar to partial sums, where you're going to think, you just went around your elbow, uh, you know, to get to somewhere else. I shouldn't say that. Um, in the opposite change algorithm for addition, you pick an add-in to adjust so that it ends in one or more zeros. But whatever adjustments you do to that add-in, whatever you did to make it into one or more zeros, then you have to do the opposite to the other add-in. Now, in the beginning, whenever I first learned this, I thought, this is not worth the time that it takes to do this. But then whenever the, I watched another video and the teacher took it one step further, I thought, oh, well, that, that does make it a whole lot easier. So you're going to see um, what's going to happen here. I'm going to give you a second in case you want to finish writing that down. All right, so opposite change algorithm. You pick an add-in to adjust so that it ends in one or more zeros. But whatever adjustments you do to that add-in, you have to do the, the opposite to the other add-in. All right, so take this problem, 
286 plus 357. All right, so in the first change, you're going to think, okay, that's great, but like that didn't help me that much. All right, so there's you could do this more than one way, but I think what I did is I said I'm going to add 3 to 357. That's going to make it 360. All right, so I'm trying to make it end in a zero. But whatever you do to that one add-in, you got to do the opposite to the other add-in. That way it's keeping everything fair. All right, so I added 3 to the 357, so I got to subtract 3 from the 286. All right, so that makes it 283. Now, when I saw this, I thought, okay, that's not that much easier. But then another video I watched, she took it one step further, and she said, okay, we can make that 360 into 400. What would you do to make that into 400? add 40. So I'm going to subtract 40 from the other one. All right, so that's going to become 243 and 400. Now that is a lot easier to add. So this one, I still think partial sums would be easier in my opinion, but this is another way that you could do it. All right, so op they're called, they call it opposite change because you have to do the opposite um, to whatever to the other add end uh, from what you did to the original add end. All right, so now we could quickly add this. What's 243 plus 400? Oh, yeah, 643. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Isn't that crazy? All right, now this is the one that's not on the homework, but I really liked it, so I wanted to show it to you. Um, so the scratch algorithm is really useful when you have a list of numbers, um, and it can be a list of like a single number, like 8 plus 9 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5, whatever, um, or it can be multi-digit, so 17 plus 27 plus whatever. Um, so this is a good algorithm for adding up long columns of numbers. So I just made one up right here, 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 8. Now, I'd never seen this before, so um, what I would probably do if I was adding these up is I would say 7 plus 8 is 15, mm -hmm. and then I would, I would probably do 9 plus 8 is 17, and then do 15 plus 17. Yeah. Um, but they were saying like students would probably say 7 plus 8 is 15. And then they try to add 9. And so they're just kind of trying to keep up with numbers in their head. So this scratch algorithm is one way that you can teach um, where you don't have to keep up with anything in your head. All right. So what you do is you're going to start adding just like we did. And whenever you get to something more than 10, you're going to make a scratch mark. And that's going to keep up with your tens digits. All right, so 7 plus 8 is 15. I'm going to add that scratch mark. And then whenever I add the scratch mark, I need to add what my ones digit is at this time out to the side. So I'm going to put a little 5 out to the side to say that's my ones digit at this time. All right, then I'm going to continue down the line. 5, I'm, I'm not worried about the, the tens anymore. So I'm just going to do 5 plus 9 is what 14 that's more than 10 so I'm going to add a scratch mark yeah then I'm going to put a little four that's my ones digit now I'm going to start over four plus eight is twelve that's more than ten I'm going to add a scratch mark and what do I put out to the side a two all right, so now I am finished because I have no tens uh, to add up. So, you know, if you had something like 17, 18, 19, 18, you would add those up at that time. But since I'm done, the scratch marks are going to be my tens column. So you count your scratch marks, one, two, three, so that's three. goes in the tens place. And then whatever your last ones digit was goes in the ones.
I thought so too. I feel I feel like I feel like I like it. I like it. But uh it it definitely is uh, you know, more work. Let's do, I'm going to pause the video and we'll do one more. Okay. All right, the last topic that we need to talk about today is mental computation and estimation. So this is just some different strategies for um, estimating. It says in the grade four core curriculum standards, students should, should be able to assess the reasonableness of answers using mental computation and estimation strategies, including rounding. So your book emphasizes that you want to um, make sure students understand the estimation is, you know, not what you want to use when you need an exact answer. If you're a nurse or if you're, you know, an engineer, then you, you don't want to estimate. You want to, you know, get the, the exact answer. But estimation is good for your day-to-day -day life, like if you're trying to figure out, do I have enough money in the bank to check out at Walmart? All right, so uh, good for everyday life, not good for um, any type of career where you need an exact answer. All right, so a couple of um, strategies that we're going to talk about. I took off um, using and making compatible numbers because that was not on the homework, but we will talk about adding from the left, breaking up and bridging, and trading off. <coughs> All right, so adding from the left. All right, so say we have this problem, 76 plus 25. You're going to add the tens. This is kind of similar to partial sums, so 70 plus 20 is 90. So adding the tens. Then you add the ones, six plus five is 11. Then you're gonna say, um, just gonna add my two sums up, 90 plus 11 is 101. All right, so this is not an estimation strategy, this is a mental math strategy. And to me, this is, I would say this is the exact same as partial sums. All right, so we would say this is same as partial sums. So like we were talking about earlier, is partial sum something that you would want to use on a standardized test? Probably not, but it's a good mental math strategy. And it's probably something that we've all done something similar to this before and we just haven't formalized it or called it a name. All right, so breaking up and bridging. I know for sure this one is on the homework. I remember seeing the directions like use the breaking up and bridging strategy to solve the problem. All right, so breaking up and bridging, you're going to take the first number and add it to the tens in the second number. So 76 plus 25, you're going to do 76 plus 20. So just adding that first number to the tens digit. Then you're going to take whatever was left over in the ones place and add it to that sum. All right, so 76 plus 20 is 96. We have five left over from the 25. So you're going to do 96 plus 5 is 101. So again, another mental math strategy, slightly different than partial sums. All right, so in this one, you're taking the, the top add-in. That one stays the same. It's just the second add-in that gets um, broken apart. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a little note here that says the first, in this one, the way you can tell it apart from partial sums is that the first add-in stays the same. It does not get broken up. All 
All right, so the first add in stays the same. Right. Yes. To the ones from the second number, the ones, what was in the ones place? We only have three more minutes, so. Yes, yes. Yep, that 76 stays the same. All right, so. Why doesn't it? Oh, there we go. All right, so trading off. This is kind of similar to, um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, the one where we uh, like subtracted three, added three, what was that called? Opposite change? Yeah. yeah. All right, so on this one, you take one of your add-ins and you're going to add something to it to make a multiple of 10. All right, so something that ends in zero. All right, so for the first one, you're going to add four to that 76 to make it 80. You know, similarly, you could have added five to 25 to make it 30. But whatever you did to that first add-in, you're going to do the opposite um, for the second add-in. So subtract four from that second add-in to account for the fact that you added four. Now we have 80 plus 21, which is something we can do a little bit easier in our heads. And then you just add those two numbers. So these are all mental math strategies. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that, um, seeing like the different ways you could change that. Comparing them, like how is this different, yeah. All right, so we're going to stop there, and I will um, –